Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. CSEA. I love my job just because it's such an awesome way to give back to the community. Knowing that I can help out and knowing that I do every day makes me feel great. The work that I do is shaping the community in a really positive way, and I'm really proud of that. Winner of a New York State Emmy for Best Political Program, this is New York Now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to New York Now. I'm Matt Ryan. Later on in the program, our Karen DeWitt will sit down with the head of Empire State Development, Howard Zemsky. ESD was put in charge of SUNY Poly's economic development projects after its former president, Elaine Cagliaros, was arrested on corruption charges in September. Stick around to hear what Zemsky has to say about when changes will be coming to the overall operation. Until then, we're going to send it on over to my partner from the Times Union, Casey Seiler, who will moderate our Reporters Roundtable. All right, thanks, Matt. Well, it's all over but the voting. And for our last Reporters Roundtable before voters head to the polls, I am happy to be joined at the Reporters Roundtable by John Campbell of USA Today Network and Karen DeWitt of New York State Public Radio. All right. So I'll put you on the spot. What are either the races or trends that you are going to be watching on Tuesday night? Well, I'm looking at Long Island and the state Senate races there. That's a stronghold for the Long Island Republicans. There's this big scandal going on where the Nassau County executive has been indicted along with the father of one of the state senators there. Are they going to lose seats there? If they do, they're likely to lose control of um, the Senate, which I think they're actually going to lose control of anyway, because they currently have 31 seats. You need 32 for a majority. And even if all the incumbents keep their seats, they don't have enough for a majority. So I think it's kind of over for them. But it's just how how bad is it going to be? How many seats are they going to lose? And from from you know a New York state government per perspective, it's all about the suburbs. I mean, it's Long Island. It's the lower Hudson Valley, the mid Hudson Valley. Um, because, it, you know, we as state government reporters, all of our eyes are going to be on the New York State Senate. And, um, you know, it is that delicate balance right now. You also have the, the IDC, the Independent Democratic Conference, uh, the five members who uh, could really play kingmaker here, too. So, uh, you know, we're going to be watching the, the, uh, the races in the lower Hudson Valley the, on Long Island to see if they will flip Republican to Democrat or if, in a couple cases, if Democrats can hold on to their seats. The five breakaway Democrats in the past have gone with the Republicans and allowed them to be a coalition of the majority, even when the Republicans didn't have enough seats. I think that was in 2012. But I, I just don't think that's going to happen mm -hmm. this time. There's too much political pressure for them to do that. Although the IDC, they're not saying. I've tried to get an interview with Senator Klein, who's the head of it. I, they don't even answer my emails anymore. <laughs> and they're being very quiet yeah. about which way they're going to tip their hand. I think they're kind of enjoying that they are in the seat of power right now. Don't negotiate in the press, yeah, I right. think is what That's they say. Number one lesson. What about the Trump factor, the, or the Clinton factor for that matter? The, the, in other words, the idea that the top of the ticket could either help or really hurt some of these down-ballot races, including in the legislature. Well, you know, statewide, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton is expected to, to roll to victory in New York. You know, she's, it's a heavily, heavily Democratic state. But when you break it down into individual districts, into um, you know different parts of the state, you know Donald Trump is is more popular in in certain rural areas, in in you know such as you know we were talking about the the Mid Hudson Valley there, you know the Sioux Serino's district includes part of Putnam County, which is very conservative, and and you know likely is is more in favor of Donald Trump. So uh, statewide, you know I think that. Uh, Hillary Clinton at the top of the ticket benefits down ballot Democrats. But when you get into individual races, you know, it really depends on where you are in the state. Yeah, I agree. I thought it was going to be much more of a factor with Trump being very unpopular at a certain point and the surge of the Democrats and maybe a Democratic sweep. But, you know, I think you're right. I think it's individual districts. Upstate, there's some places where Republicans, particularly Republican incumbents, are just going to be very strong. Even if a voter might vote for Hillary Clinton for president, they might still vote for that Republican senator. And then, of course, in New York City is the Democratic stronghold. So I don't think it's going to play as, you know, we could be proven wrong. I'd be, I'd be happy to be proven wrong. It would probably be more <laughs> exciting. But yeah, it seems like they're not, the presidential are not going to be as much of a factor. The only thing is turnout. 
You know, how well, many people are going to turn out? Exactly are there Republicans right. who are some are depressed about Trump and not crazy about him? Are they not going to turn out? Are there some Democrats who are just tired of Hillary Clinton, especially with the FBI and the, the Comey stuff that came up and just like, you know, one more kind of scandal? So that's the big question, I think. We're, we're already seeing a lot of late money pouring into races, including the Susurino race that you just mentioned. I want to move on to yeah. talk about uh, John's uh, outstanding, fascinating story this week, noting that 514 highway signs that have been put up on uh, on state major roadways. The only problem with them, according to the federal government, they seem to violate both federal and state laws. Right, right, right. If you've, if you've spent any time traveling the state uh, in, in the last, you know, six months or so, you've seen these signs. I mean, they say, depending where you're at in the state, they say, welcome to New York or uh, enjoy the New York state experience. And they, they tout the state's different tourism programs, Taste New York. Um, path through history. Path through history. I love New York. See, we've and all read them carefully, right? right? <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're, they're generally grouped in five, or one right after the other. Sign, 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 sign. Uh, and and they've, you know, they've, they've caused some issues in local communities who don't really like the signs. But it turns out that back in 2013, when the state came up with this idea for the signs, when the Cuomo administration came up with the, the idea for the signs, they actually asked permission from the federal government. The federal government has standards for um, what can be on highway signs because they want to keep uniform signs from state to state to state. Uh, the, the federal government, in no uncertain terms, said no. Uh, and we, I, I came across some documents that, that showed this. And six months after that, in 2014, the governor announced them in the state of the state of address <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and said, we're going to have these signs everywhere. And they started putting them up and uh, the, the feds pushed back, said, you know, what are you doing? We told you, no, these these don't conform to to federal or state standards. And uh, it seems like they kind of stopped for a while. But earlier this year, I mean, they, they started popping up everywhere. Because well, the idea is that they don't want signs that are so complex that basically you're reading about yes. the outstanding tourism a venue and upcoming you and you drift over into, into, into the, the next lane. And there's but five in a row. But actually a pretty yeah. big issue because if there were a big accident because of these signs, they'd be in a, in a lot of trouble for it. So I'm surprised that they just, well, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but they did keep <laughs> going on and on and on because I think the Cuomo administration has a tendency to say, we're right about this. We saw that in the Hoosick Falls water dispute where they fought with the EPA. Um, they just, if they think they're right on right. something, they just keep going and they don't back down. Well, and, and if you look at the, the course between the state and the feds, the feds lay out very specifically, you know, these are non-conforming signs, they have symbols that aren't allowed, this and that. The state says, you know, well, we believe they're in compliance with federal law, but never really explain <laughs> yeah. just, why just Just saying why. it is enough. Yeah, it's so in compliance. It, well, it, what's the, what's the kind of, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, that's, you know? that's the question well, I have. Too. So far, the feds have, have not really signaled that they're they haven't really signaled what they're going to do about it. But theoretically, so these signs that are on highways that get federal funding, they could jeopardize federal funding for those highways. The feds have not gone to that extreme yet, but if this battle, which has already been going on for three years, continues to go on, you know, who knows what could happen. So they don't have the power to just come and rip them down or anything like no, that. No, but they could, they could withhold funding. Yeah. yeah. Did somebody suggest okay. the headline, Cuomo's Way or the Highway? <laughs> on the highway, that is. Missed opportunity. Missed, Missed opportunity. opportunity. Yeah, All maybe right. we'll have more chances to do that. Yes. One thing that people will not have an opportunity to do on Election Day is take a ballot selfie. That is, go into your polling place and snap a photo of your ballot before you drop it in the optical scanner. Um, a judge uh, responding to a lawsuit that was brought by voters who want to be able to do this said a last minute judicially imposed change in the protocol at 5,300 polling places would be a recipe for delays and a disorderly and a disorderly election. Basically, the people would be in there trying to get the perfect selfie. Mm -hmm. and well, that's true. The big things. line. Wait, I'm sorry, you can't vote yet. I have to take my my selfie there. <laughs> it's it's. I mean, this is an issue that uh, you know is brought on by the advent of, of cell phones and, and technology and social media, et cetera. Uh, you know, the law goes back to the, I believe, the 1890s, mm. um, before any of that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, before right. Apple even existed. And, yeah. uh, but but it's, it's only a completed ballot. You can't take a photo with a completed ballot. So 
beware. Well, now I'm going to sound like the Cuomo administration with the, with the feds. What are they going to do? Arrest people if they do it and put it on social yeah, media? Yeah, I mean, I think people will try to do it. It doesn't seem that harmful. And really. the fear, well, the fear is that mm. basically your boss or a political ward healer or somebody like that can say, you need to send me a picture of your ballot to demonstrate how you voted. In other words, we're trying right. to get your ward all in line. Well, that's true. It could morph into that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, possibility. But don't do it. But I think you can walk out and write down on a note exactly who you voted for and take a picture of that and put it out, can't you? Well, okay, that's a way around it, then. All right, but I'm not liable. <laughs> I'm not liable for suggesting that. All right, that's where we're going to have to leave it. Thanks very much to John Campbell, great story, of USA Today Network and Karen DeWitt of New York State Public Radio. Well, as promised earlier, time now for our interview with the president and CEO of Empire State Development, Howard Zemsky, who sat down with Karen DeWitt earlier this week at the state capitol. Howard Zemsky, thanks for joining us on thanks. New York Now. We've Thank you for having me. We've been trying to get you on for a while now, so, <laughs> so this is great. I'm well, a moving target. <laughs> yeah, well, your biggest job right now is essentially to salvage these big economic development contracts that have all led to this corruption scandal that's swirling. What have you been able to do so far? Well, I mean, I don't think I necessarily use the word salvage, so that's maybe too um, dramatic or sort of paints a story of um, you know, turnaround. So some of them. So more like fix them. <laughs> no, I think just to uh, steady them uh, and advance them in many cases um, and strengthen the teams around them. So you know, we've been in touch with the CEOs of these uh, various businesses, of which there are many, and we've had our ESD team from um, all the disciplines, whether it's finance or legal loans and grants, project management, um, you know, get involved to bolster the team. I think, you know, maybe it's fair to say SUNY probably was a bit overwhelmed with the number of projects relative to the staff, and so well, we've approached it that way. That's a polite way of putting it, I would say, considering that there have been the locus of the, the bid rigging um, scandals. Your original deadline was the end of October. You were gonna review everything, come up with yep. some recommendations, but you haven't been able to make that deadline. Why is that? Right, so we're gonna wait till our ESD board meeting or maybe perhaps a little before then just to get it right the first time, I would say, just as a practical matter. The, um, you know, the amount of coordination between the different boards, between SUNY, between the Research Foundation, the ESD, our legal teams, um, just looking at all the potential implications and changes, the myriad of changes that we're gonna make, it just felt prudent to take a little bit more time, so that was my fault. Um, I was probably more aggressive than I should have been in saying that we get it done in 10 days, but it won't take very long, and we're actively working on it. So what exactly is happening? You have um, lawyers on staff at Empire State Development. Are they looking at these contracts line by line, and are they finding anything unusual, anything's jumped out as n not as it should be? No, we're just assessing each project independently from e every project, and we're just really looking to see where it is. So, for example, I think to the maybe the essence of your question, uh, if there is a potential contract or a predisposition toward a contract with somebody that maybe was a preferred supplier of um, poly and it hasn't been let yet, we may go back and say, look, the way ESD would do this is different and you know, let's kind of back up a little bit and do it anew. Is so, that, is that a polite way of saying some of these contractors may have been favored improperly the way that these deals are going? No, it's just a polite way of saying that people from Buffalo are polite. So <laughs> that's how we speak, and um, it's just you know, there's you know, we're approaching it. Um, you know, we're 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 going in with our eyes open. I think. You know, in fairness, Karen, um, you got a lot of good people there, and you know, I mean, I know what it's like when somebody does something wrong and kind of casts a shadow, or someone potentially does something wrong, and that kind of casts a shadow on a lot of good work by a lot of good people. So I'm sensitive to that. I'm careful not to characterize things. You know, I'm not, not, not you necessarily, but you know, media can have a way of kind of characterizing things in dramatic style and paint things with a broad brush stroke. So I think in fairness, you know, a lot of good people doing a lot of good work and, you know, we're, we're working with a lot of them. So what you're saying is that there was a few 
bad apples, and this is why this happened. It isn't systematic corruption it, the way that the Sunni poly contracts were done. Yeah, right. So I think there's a lot, a lot of good work there, and I think, um, you know, when you think about the importance of high technology to the state of New York, and you know, these projects were upstate oriented projects, and you know, they were able to bring some, you know, really exciting companies to the table. So we're, you know, looking to advance these. The communities upstate are, you know, looking for the economic impact, and I think we're looking at it. We're going in with our eyes open. We're making some corrections where we think it's appropriate, and we're advancing where we think it's appropriate, and I think we're using, you know, good judgment, and that's how we're approaching it. Well, that's the concern, isn't it, that some of these projects might fall through now? Are there any in danger of not being able to be carried out because of what's happened? I mean, I think the vast majority of them um, will be completed, and in all of my conversations with the CEOs, they're, they've been very positive about you know, their desire to be growing their business in New York State, in some cases relocating to New York State. Um, so, you know, business is dynamic and it's changing and very changeable. And over the course of time, and this investigation has taken some time and that kind of put a lot of projects kind of on a slow track. And so it may be that, you know, there are some that just by virtue of kind of a, you know, kind of loss of time in the last year, might be impacted, but well, the vast majority are, well, um, are, are I'd say, in, in good shape and in getting in much better shape. What well, ones that you said were on the slow track that might not happen, can you name them? No, and I'm not, I don't even have, um, a sp I'm not, you know, I don't have a specific company in mind. It's just when you have so many that are in various levels of completion, uh, and as much time has passed, um, you know, it's just the nature of business that, you know, some will, you know, maybe be larger, some perhaps smaller. It's just, you know, it is the way. It's a very dynamic, that whole private sector thing. It's, uh, it's changeable and it's competitive and time matters. And, but it's, it's in good shape. Like, I'm really pleased, basically, with the receptiveness we've had and the response from the businesses and from the CEOs. And I think we're being more communicative mm -hmm. and more um, open with them about where the projects are, and I think they appreciate that. Well, what happens with um, the projects like Simonelli, <laughs> who's building the Solar City factory, and Core Development, whose yep. CEOs have been charged with crimes? Like, do those projects go forward? I mean, how practically do you work with these companies? Well, yeah, I mean, keep in mind, Solar City is like 98.7%, you know, complete. <laughs> so, yeah. of course, and, you know, a lot of great work has gone into building that facility, and we're very excited about the prospect of them ramping up, which they're gearing to do. I was just there last week with, um, President Obama's head of the chief technology officer is a very exciting project. And, um, you know, mostly the people that are left to get paid there, frankly, are subcontractors. So we're obviously working, um, you know, very aggressively to make sure that people who have done the work get paid and the project is completed, the jobs happen, the economic impact happens. And, you know, that's. You know, that's where that project's at. And there's, of course, been a lot of publicity about the potential merger with Tesla and the collaboration with Panasonic. Yeah. Does and that I can worry tell you, you want me at to all? stop talking for a second, so now... Yeah, yeah. Does, that, does that worry Does that worry you at all, that, that uh, Solar City? I mean, to the outside observer, sometimes seems kind of shaky. You know, they have to merge with Tesla, and now they're going to use technology from Panasonic. It's definitely changing from the original plan. And New York State taxpayers are going to own this factory no matter right. what. And so, is, should we be good. worried? No, it's great, no. I think. So, of course, you know, people change, people find change worrisome. I get that. Um, so, I would take you through the changes at Solar City and say, look, that deal started with a company called Salevo. Salevo was a promising solar technology in California, pre-revenue. So when SUNY announced, when SUNY Poly announced that initial deal, it was with a pre-revenue promising 
technology company. That was our partner. Subsequent to that, they were acquired by Solar City. Solar City is, you know, a two and a half billion market cap company, the largest installer of solar panels. So our partner went from Solevo, small pre-revenue technology company, to Solar City, much larger, uh, number one market share, solar installation. So that's good, mm -hmm. right? Our partner got stronger and bigger. The potential of them being acquired by Tesla, one of the leading clean energy companies in the world, 30 billion market capitalization, another strong partner. The collaboration with Panasonic, Karen, there's one of the world's leading uh, producers of photovoltaic cells, another 20 plus billion market capitalization company, helping to bring their manufacturing expertise and their financial resources to the table. Now we're talking about a behemoth, a clean energy behemoth in Buffalo. Names like Panasonic, Tesla, Solar City. Remember, this started with a company you never heard of called Solevo. So these evolutions or changes, as you call them, have been very positive. And I, I, you know, I'm very hopeful that the merger goes through with Tesla. I think it's great to have those companies based in New York State and in upstate and in Buffalo. So I think it's very good. One of the somewhat unusual things that SUNY Poly did was they used these not-for-profit entities, Fort Schuyler, <coughs> Fuller Road Management, to negotiate these contracts. Right. And that's where the allegations of the bid rigging have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, going forward, um, are you going to scrap those not-for-profit companies? Do you think that uh, you yourself have said they're, they're pretty opaque, <laughs> right. and it's, it's hard to know what was going on with yeah. them and a source of, of trouble. So Right. And so, you know, there, those are some of the issues that we're looking at in terms of making sure we don't have to renegotiate all of our contracts with these myriad of companies. Is there a way to have the not-for-profit operate in an entirely different manner? Um, what can we do to the bylaws? What can we do um, to the governance? What can we do to the way we communicate, with the way we procure? You know, how can we do things in a way that both advance the projects and um, make everything less opaque? But shouldn't you just get rid of these not-for-profits? <laughs> I mean, is not it possible? Necessarily. No? Yeah. no, not necessarily. What is I good think, about them? Well, they have legal contracts with companies, and that's, you know, important. So, so, so you know, what you're they saying have you're, liabilities. You're, you're they saying have you're kind of stuck with them They now. have contracts. So, you know, and again, you know, just be careful the way we sort of characterize things broadly um, versus, um, you know, individual incidents potentially to be determined, legality or illegality. Um, but. I think, and we agree, you know, transparency is important, the process is important, the integrity, the confidence in these projects, in the process is very important. The governor, uh, when he asked ESD to get involved, said for job number one is to make sure nothing like this happens again. So yeah. we get it, we take it very seriously. Can you guarantee that, that nothing like this is gonna happen again? <laughs> I can guarantee it, um, you know, under ESD's, um, control, uh, have a tremendous amount of confidence in the way ESD operates, has operated. I think that's been borne out time and time again. Yeah, we would just point out, you guys really are not implicated in this scandal. No, not at all. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, we see the governor's invitation to assume responsibility for these projects as a tremendous vote of confidence. We're proud of that, and I think we've earned that. So I would say, you know, everyone can have a ton of confidence that ESD has, you know, well-seasoned, well-proven, um, you know, 500 professionals who do economic development full-time. It's really all we do, and I think we're the right people for the job, so I, I feel great about it. Time now for our New York Now poll question, where we're asking which political party will fare better on election day, let us know as always by logging on to our website, nynow.org. Now, the last time we saw you, we asked which political party would you like to see control the state Senate? And the majority of our voters said the Democrats. Stephen in Brooklyn watching on WNET was not one of those, however. He said, New York state government entirely controlled at the executive and legislative levels by the Democratic Party would be a disaster for the citizens of the Empire State. 
Edmond in Lake George watching on Mountain Lake PBS agreed. The Senate Democrats are just way too liberal for upstate New York in particular. And lastly, Don in Rochester watching on WXXI said he wanted the Democrats. Campaign finance reform is the number one item that needs passing, and it hasn't happened under current conditions. Give the Dems a chance to see if they can implement it and hold them accountable if they can't. Thanks to all our voters this week. We hope to hear from you again. Just head to nynow.org. It is there you can watch any of our past programs. Plus, follow links to us on social media, including Twitter, where our handle is at nynow underscore PBS. You can also follow the daily activities at the state capitol by going to the Capitol Confidential blog run by Casey Seiler and his staff. Just punch in timesunion.com. All right, well, that's all the time we have this week. We end with a plea. We know because you are watching this program that you are likely in the habit of voting. You care about state and national politics. You might, however, have friends or family members who are not in the habit of going to the polls. We ask that you share with them your desire to see them participate in our democracy by voting between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Tuesday. Couldn't have said it better. Get out there and vote. With Casey Seiler, I'm Matt Ryan. We leave you today with footage from just outside the Capitol on a gorgeous first day of November. Thanks for watching and tune in next week for our election roundup. And of course, don't forget to vote. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. CSEA. I'm a police, fire, and EMS dispatcher. When their first phone call comes to us, we get the fire, the police, and the ambulance to their location. I'm keeping them safe by providing them with a the service that they expect.